This video contains minor visual spoilers, but I will not be showing or discussing any major story elements of the game. You know when you keep seeing something particular pop up online everywhere you look and you have to tell yourself, that looks cool, but I'll check it out later? That was definitely me. Meanwhile, I'm seeing multiple people on Twitter mentioning it, seeing YouTube videos pop up about it, People were saying how this was one of their favorite horror game experiences of the year. I resisted, but it kept crawling back into my head. And now here I am. It finally got to me. And I'm sorry I waited, and now I am part of that collective. That hive mind of people that you've seen that have told you, and will continue to tell you, and that I'm telling you right now. Do not sleep on Signalis. Signalis is a survival horror game that started development way back in 2014, and as far as I can tell, this is the first game developed by Germany-based Rose Engine, a team of only two people. Shout out to Yuri Stern and Barbara Whitman. In their own words, Signalis is a love letter to the golden era of survival horror, and it definitely shows. This game drips with inspiration from PlayStation 1 horror classics such as Resident Evil and Silent Hill. In fact, let's get some of those Silent Hill 2 comparisons out of the way. Elster and James Sunderland both carry a photo of the person that they are looking for. Elster begins her journey in Sierpinski by staring intensely at a mirror in a bathroom, jumping down really creepy holes. Red saves screen with creepy sound, jumping down more weird holes. A puzzle involving placing rings on women's fingers. This one is actually Evangelia, but it's still pretty cool. This safe covered in chains. This thing! We really love going into holes. And that's not all, but a lot of them include spoilers, so I won't be mentioning them. And there's a lot of other media reference in Signalis as well. Quite a bit of Lovecraft, and his work is directly quoted in several sections. To say homage is all Signalis has to offer would be a disservice. It is indisputable that many aspects of it are taken from other games and media of the genre, but does that make it a shallow amalgam copy? No, not at all. It doesn't blatantly throw references at you, hoping you Leo meme at them. It uses those references to great effect in the presentation of its story and the themes within that story. Even if you don't know or pick up on the reference, you don't need to in order to understand what the game is trying to tell you. It helps to understand the meaning, sure, but it isn't necessary to pick up on any of those themes the game is trying to get across. And if you do understand a reference, it only serves to enhance and clarify your experience rather than distract you from it. Of course, everyone is going to have their preference. What does and does not work for me won't be the same for you. In my time spent with Signalis, nothing took me out of the game, and most of the time I found myself giddy that some of these were present at all. But your mileage here may vary. But for me, it felt just right. A creepy, bleak, nostalgic journey that highlights the best of horror games past. I played through Signalis twice, once on normal difficulty and again on survival. And I would have played through survival on my first playthrough, but there wasn't a difficulty option when starting a new game. It was only after beating the full game that I realized that there is a combat accessibility option in the gameplay menu that I then changed it for my second go around. Experienced survival horror players won't find a particular challenge here though. Early in my playthrough, I was worried because the game was feeling a bit too easy. There wasn't much of a need to even kill the enemies as I could nimbly and narrowly dart past most of them. Not that I'm demanding a punishing experience exactly, but I wasn't feeling any threat from their presence. Later on the game does up the ante as far as how many enemies you are dealing with on screen, which I actually appreciated as I felt my careful playstyle earlier in the game was rewarded. Survival difficulty does limit ammo drops significantly, and enemies hit much harder. So I definitely recommend starting there if you're a genre veteran. You 
you play through the game as Elster, or more accurately, an Elster unit, a mass-produced artificial biomechanical life form known as a replica. And waking up from your pod, you find that your ship, the Penrose, has crashed on a frozen planet. And after exploring, you realize that your only crewmate is missing. Journeying off into the snow, you find yourself at an ominous monolith archway. There, you descend into your first of many holes, and then into another creepier, fleshy hole. Inside of that, you find... And you arrive at the mining colony Sierpinski. And it doesn't take long before you discover that something has gone wrong. The colony is in ruin. Abandoned. Every human, known in this world as Gestalts, has died from a mysterious illness. It's infected the replicas present as well, but instead of killing them, the disease seems to scramble their minds and drive them mad. The corruption manifests as a gross, pulsing meat that continues to spread as you progress throughout the game. The atmosphere and art direction are the absolute shining aspects of Signalis. It can be a visually stunning game when it wants to be, and downright unsettling when it needs to be. Beautiful, eye-catching anime-style pixel art and well-crafted low-polygon models give it an accurate look for games of the PS1 era, all while set in a well-realized sci-fi world with appropriately mysterious set pieces. What starts as standard dark corridors will eventually succumb to the fleshy and rusty corruption infecting the colony. It shows exactly as much as it needs to, which sometimes can be very little, letting your imagination do most of the work, or it can force you to uncomfortably stare at an image just long enough to make your skin crawl. Be through the intense imagery or mysterious characters that you'll meet throughout your journey, Signalis is capable of making you feel exactly what it wants you to in the moment. It creates an unnerving, oppressive, and gripping sense of dread that holds nothing back visually, and that's just the kind of thing that works for me. No reliance on jump scares needed here at all. Just horrific set dressing. Like this. Elevator filled with corpses. Or another flesh hole. Cool. I love the subtle creepy touches just as much too. Like the fact that every camera follows you around all of the time. The pulsing of the flesh corruption as it just... Ugh. I was transported back to the absolute terror that I had playing horror games as a kid, which is the intent, and it succeeds. I'm in my 30s, and I love horror everywhere I can find it. And I played this during the day with the lights on, and I was still getting chills. And I admit that part of that is nostalgia or something, but I have to give success where it's found, and I appreciate anything that can pull that off. Occasionally throughout the game, you'll receive these visions that appear to be recorded on old VHS tapes, as well as actual VHS tapes that you get to watch. These are really well done with image quality, flickering, and static effects. Bulky CRT monitors are the style here, and Rose Engine has done a great job adding era accurate hums and buzzing sounds. Every line of static that crosses the screen, the whir of a floppy disk being loaded in, it all feels appropriate. And seeing the glow of a monitor as the only light source in an otherwise completely dark room is awesome. Opening your inventory or map is accompanied by the sound of a single old keyboard key. And it's also displayed on a CRT screen, which I tried not to think too much about as I was playing through the game. All of this is very Blade Runner or Alien in how the now retro technology fits into the future sci-fi setting, but it never feels out of place. And that's thanks to the excellent sound design. I mentioned the hums of the screens and the keyboards and the static, but even just the sound of the wind outside fills you with a sense of isolation. There's this moment early on in the game and I felt like I was in John Carpenter's The Thing. Most of the time, there is no or very little in the way of music, and the music that 
is present is extremely effective. A mixture of soft piano and synths for the softer emotional or bizarre moments hit me every time. What I didn't love was that when combat started, there's a flurry of loud mechanical and industrial music, and I was okay with the occasional metallic scrapes and clangs, but during combat, it was a bit overwhelming, and that could be intentional, and it could well work for you, but it didn't for me. There are only two composers that worked on this, Cicada Sirens and 1000 Eyes, and Rose Engine has the full soundtrack up on YouTube, so I definitely recommend checking that out. The gameplay here is your classic survival horror fare. You venture out, encountering hostile enemies, finding locked rooms or a puzzle you can't solve. You keep exploring, finding more locked doors until you eventually solve a puzzle or you find a key or an item that allows you to access another area that has an item you need for another puzzle or to gain access to another room. You know the drill. There are these occasional Resident Evil style save rooms with its softer musical theme where you're completely safe. And you'll also find a storage box where you will store things. Elster abides by something in the game called the Rule of Six, which means her personal inventory can only hold a maximum of six items at a time, which is another gameplay reference to Resident Evil. Six is a very harsh limit here, and even in classic Resident Evils, Chris had items outside of his inventory that he could make use of, and that's not the case here. Choosing how to approach a situation entirely depends on the items you have in stock. Combat doesn't feel great, but hey, neither was James awkwardly swinging a pipe around like an idiot. It works for what the game is in order to create a real sense of pressure with each encounter, though. Your arsenal includes a standard pistol, shotgun, etc. You also have some equipable defensive melee tools like the one-use but instant knockout stun rod. These have their own equipment space, but are still counted towards your six item limit. Aiming your weapons will slow down your movement, and will make a targeting reticule appear over the enemy. Holding your aim on a single target without firing will make the reticule slowly shrink, and the smaller it is, the more effective that your following shot will be. This is your number one way to pace yourself and conserve ammo, but it can be challenging to stand your ground sometimes. After enough shots, enemies will fall writhing to the ground and will eventually get back up unless you give them the stomp with your petite feet. Hooves? Hold on. Does Elster have feet? Most enemies in the game have a chance of getting back up as you move past their corpses. And this is entirely random. It could happen in a room you just cleared, but you know it's going to happen after passing through a hall half a dozen times, and only when you have no ammo and used your last healing item, this is when that hallway full of enemies decides it's going to get back up and completely ruin your time. Stupid piece of shit. It really kept me on my toes. Weighing the risks of too many trips back and forth can burn through supplies if too many enemy replicas decide that death hasn't earned them quite yet. Enemies can be permanently dispatched by incinerating them, think the Crimson Heads from RE Remake, and you have two ways to do this, the flare gun and thermite. Shooting enemies with the flare gun downs them instantly and will burn the body as a bonus. Just shoot, run over, and give them that dead space boot. The downside is that it only carries one shot before needing to reload and ammo for it is very scarce. The Thermite Flare is a defensive item, much like the Stun Rod. It's a melee attack that instantly downs and incinerates most enemies. Also, you can drop it on already stomped enemies if you don't feel like dealing with them later. Clearing an area you know you'll be revisiting frequently or making a safe route is usually the way to go here. There's also a camera and a flashlight, two very useful items that not only take up valuable inventory space, but they use the tool space that the stun rods and thermite do. The camera isn't required to beat the game, but is incredibly useful for remembering complicated or vague solutions to puzzles. The flashlight, however, is mandatory in a few portions of the game. And since it takes the place of your defensive item, it can put you at a severe disadvantage if you find yourself overwhelmed and underprepared. My favorite piece of gear in the game, and by far one of the most unique aspects of Signalis, is the radio receiver. This is something you pick up very early in the game, 
It doesn't take up a space in your inventory, thankfully. Instead, it is placed in your menu. You can tune it to different frequencies with various outcomes depending on where you are in the game. And it's vital to solving certain puzzles, and it can net you some bonus items if you take the time to mess around with it. When you turn it on, it plays whether your menu is open or closed. And it can even have an effect on certain enemies if it's set to the correct frequency. It's also the key to a very rad secret that fans have dug into. And I won't talk about it here, but trust me, it's really freaking cool and worth your time to look into. Props to Rose Engine for pulling off something so incredible. Alright, let's talk puzzles, because Signalis has them, and they're serviceable. The most unique ones are the ones that utilize the radio, and which I thought were pretty cool. And most others are, well, this water pump one sure looks familiar. And it feels like the game knows this one sucks, because it gives you the exact solution on a piece of paper in the same room. There's also this thing, which I didn't understand what I was even doing at first. Then there's this part with a key card that requires you to translate the pattern from one card to a blank card using a machine in another room. It may not sound difficult, but remembering the exact orientation of the card to match how to input the pattern to the new card was a bit troublesome. This is where the camera comes in handy. Basically, it's an item to avoid backtracking or pointless revisiting because you can't remember shit, which I often couldn't. I guess you could save time by taking a screenshot or take a photo with your phone, but it's neat that they added this knowing that some of the solutions were a little challenging to remember. Solving puzzles like these will reward you with keys, items, or clues in order to complete a much larger objective. And once that larger puzzle is solved or appropriate items collected, this denotes the end of a particular level, and there's no backtracking to prior levels either. Once you pass through the big door, or travel through an elevator, or whatever lies on the other side of an area-wide puzzle, you won't be able to return to that, so plan accordingly. There are also a few honestly awesome first-person segments that mix things up here, each taking place in a completely different looking location without feeling disjointed for the rest of the game. These were a refreshing surprise whenever they would pop up, but they're all so incredibly short and that was a little disappointing. They were my favorite part of this game. I loved the train and the beach and I wanted to see more events like these. The pair at Rose Engine seemed to know how to throw you into a new and immediately unnerving environment at a moment's notice and I would love to see what they could do with a full first-person horror game. The story of Signalis is multi-layered, but at its core, it's a tragedy. A story of a promise, of loss, pain, and clinging on to precious memories. And most of this is presented to you in the form of dreamlike cutscenes or vague cryptic visions. Very little is directly explained to you, and most of what you see may not even be real depending on your interpretation. The backstory of Sierpinski and its inhabitants are explained in various notes and journals that become crazier and crazier as you progress. Now, I'm a bit of a lore nerd, so I immediately dug in, made my theories, but your level of enjoyment about this will be different from mine, but even a surface level look at the story is satisfying. By the end, my head was spinning with which parts of the journey were real or not, and what the visions meant and how it all connected, I was so eager to re-explore the game and see things with my new perspective. And this is no doubt purposeful as there are multiple endings which entice you to have multiple playthroughs. There are four, technically five, endings with three of them based on various requirements such as 
playthrough length, damage taken, times healed, time spent speaking with NPCs, and the ending I received on my first playthrough was the memory ending, which one requirement stated that to get that ending, my run couldn't be more than five or six hours, but my playtime totaled around nine, so I'm not sure what happened there. It could be updated by now, or maybe the information I was looking at was inaccurate, so apologies if that ends up being the case. I know Signalis isn't a perfect original product, and that some of it comes down to a, a matter of taste, but it's definitely hooked me. It hit all the right buttons, and it might not be for you, but if you enjoy any of the aspects of this, the anime aesthetic, or any of the references that I've mentioned, I heavily suggest that you at least give it a shot. And I look forward to whatever Rosengen does next, if there's anything planned. If so, I hope it doesn't take as long. But if it gives us another game like Signalis, it will absolutely be worth that wait. Hey, thank you for watching all the way to the end. This is my first time making something like this, so I really appreciate it. I know it can be better, cleaner, and I plan on working hard on making more and better quality videos in the future, so consider liking the video and subscribing. It means the world. And until next time, thank you.